Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Carlin, your host for Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine? And today I'm really excited to have an unusual specialist. I want to introduce you to Dr. Micah Yu. He is a rheumatologist. He's board certified in internal medicine, in lifestyle medicine. And I'll tell you, let you in on a little secret. He just took the rheumatology boards yesterday. So very soon to be triple board certified. How are you, Dr. Yu? I'm doing well, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, it's really fun to have you. To have you. And we had your wife on the show a few weeks ago, Dr. Marissa Mandala, and she mm -hmm. was great. So oh, yeah. Well, we start off every show by saying, hey, doc, what's new in plant-based medicine? So tell me, what's new in plant-based medicine? Mm -hmm. What's new in your specialty? So what's new is that there is a plant-based rheumatologist now. I don't know any other plant-based rheumatologist out there. And, um, and what's also new is that uh, plant-based nutrition can help with autoimmune disease and arthritis a lot. It's great. So, so that is- Oh, that Lisa, I yeah, think we, we lost you. Yeah, there we are. Can you hear me? Can you see me now? You yeah, I can hear you now. You can hear me now. Okay, good. All right, because I'm going to go I'm going to go back and forth with forth with the camp with the camera, so I get to control it from my dashboard. Mm -hmm. So that's very exciting. You're the first plant based rheumatologist that we know of right now. Hopefully, there will be more, but you will be leading okay. the way. I think that's so exciting. Tell us about what your journey was. How long have you been plant based? How did you get into this lifestyle? Go ahead. Yes. So, I mean, if I'm going to talk about how I become plant-based, I really have to go back to um, how this all started. So I was diagnosed with gout, which is a rheumatic disease. Um, at the age of 17, I went on the Atkins diet very early on. I was a football player in high school and I wanted to lose weight. I did lose about 30 pounds. However, I... Uh, being on the Atkins diet, I actually developed gout, which is when your uric acids are very high um, and they can stimulate an immune response in the system and give you a really big, um, big painful um, joint and um, they can attack multiple joints. But for me, I attacked my big toe, which is one of the classic areas mm -hmm. for gout. And then over the years, um, my inflammation um, just didn't go away. Um, so my joint pains, arthritis actually transformed into something else. And I was eventually diagnosed with spondyloarthritis. I saw multiple rheumatologists. They really couldn't figure me out. I had high inflammatory markers, but all my antibodies were negative. So when I got to my residency at Loma Linda, um, the rheumatologists there were able to finally diagnose me um, with the uh, different modalities and they use ultrasound they found inflammation at my tendons along with my joint pains and my lab values they were able to come to this diagnosis but no one really ever told me about how really diet really affects arthritis so i took a look at um plant-based nutrition and how i found that was through my wife uh dr melissa mandala she's uh on the board of directors of lifestyle medicine she told me about it i was iffy about it and then um when we both of us went to guam for a medical rotation and over there, their SDA um, at the clinic we were at, and a lot of them were plant-based. So I took a look at that. I um, watched Forks Over Knives. So I was like, let's just give this a shot. Let's see what plant-based nutrition can do for me. And within a couple months, my joint pains improved dramatically. One of my inflammatory markers went negative after years of being positive. And so that's how I discovered plant-based nutrition, how powerful it can be. Where were you in your training at that time? I was at the end of my residency when I found plant based right. nutrition. Yeah, I was two months away from going into my rheumatology fellowship. So you were going to go into rheumatology, but you didn't quite make that connection. This was fortuitous for you. Yeah, yeah. So when I got to my rheumatology fellowship, I understood how important diet was because you don't teach that in medical school. You only get 10 hours at most of nutrition training, and that's on stuff that's not really practical or stuff that you don't really remember. So um, it was very, very um, gratifying to know that diet can help my patients. Very interesting. Wow. Well done. Tina Walker says we're going to have some comments along the way. So um, that's it's incredible. It's incredible. And then you were at Loma Linda. So they're very sensitive to plant based diets anyway. And, yeah. This is, well, surprisingly, at Loma Linda, um, even though they're big on um, the 
the plant-based diet over there in residency, you don't really get exposed to the plant-based diet that much. Really? Yeah. It's but, surprising. They're not, but, the, but they're not serving meat in the hospital, right? They're not serving, they're not serving meat. meat. Yeah, they're not serving meat, but during lectures and stuff, we're not getting really taught about nutrition. We're still talking about just medicines and diagnoses and treatments. Okay, very interesting. So here you are. Um, you are uh, board certified in internal medicine and lifestyle medicine and very soon to be board certified in rheumatology. And now mm -hmm. you practice at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine in Newport yes. Beach. California. Tell me about the, about the facility and, and what your role is there, because I think you have a directorship. Yeah, so it's a, um, it's a multi-specialty clinic um, that's very new. Um, there's multiple providers here. There's my wife, Dr. Melissa McDowell, there's Dr. Angie Sadehi, um, and there's a couple of telemedicine providers as well. There's dietitians, um, James and um, Dahlia Marin as well. And um, I am the CMO here also. So um, there's a lot of things going on here. It's a very exciting new clinic with multiple providers, and it's just a place for um, healing for patients. And a way for patients to connect to different specialists as well that want plant-based uh, nutrition. And how many states are are all of you licensed in? I mean, are, does it run the gamut? Have yeah. You states yet? Where are you able to practice medicine besides California? Yeah. So, so all of us um, are licensed in different states. For me personally, I'm certainly um, currently licensed in California. Um, Arizona, I'm about to be licensed. Um, Colorado, Illinois, Florida. Um, Texas, I'm waiting for, New Jersey, I'm waiting for, and I think, oh, I'm, I just got certified, I mean, licensed in uh, Ohio and Michigan as well. So about eight states for me. So you guys are working because you do telemedicine, so you can see patients when you're licensed yeah. in the state. So that's really fabulous. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So you, and you, you told us about your rheumatologist, but you were also a patient. And I think this is really, really in interesting because how, how does that affect you now? Because you, you have experienced two autoimmune diseases, which have, have they resolved completely or are they, um, are they still somewhat present? Right. So it's so interesting being a patient and a doctor of the same specialty because when patients come to see me, they say, I have joint pains, I have this, I have that. I'm like, I completely understand you. I understand how much you're suffering. I've gone through the same thing. And as far as how I'm doing currently, so I was in, I would say, remission for about a year or two. And then sometimes, you know, when I'm stressed out, when I'm, over, I'm working overnights at a hospital too sometimes, that stress can really trigger some pain sometimes. So sometimes the pain does come back, but you know, when it does come back, it's about like 10% of what it used to be. Before it was so debilitating, I would limp to work. I would limp to the ICU to do my rotations. It was so hard. But now I really don't get that anymore. I really watch my diet. You know, stress, everyone gets stressed. Lifestyle isn't always perfect. Plant-based nutrition is just one aspect, but your lifestyle and your stress levels is another aspect as well. Sometimes it's very hard to control, um, especially when you're a doctor and you're working at the hospital. Um, so currently, you know what, I, I do take medication. I take medication for gout, uric acid levels, you know, Based on studies, the level of your uric acid doesn't really fall too much even when you go completely vegan. They've done studies on that. But at the same time, you're able to minimize medications, hopefully, when you do go on a plant-based diet. And that's what's really important. So you do need a combination of plant-based nutrition and allopathic medicine. Plant-based nutrition isn't a cure-all. Autoimmune disease um, cannot be cured. You can put it to remission, but for patients that are remission, if they do go back to the old lifestyle, um, then they can possibly flare again. So uh, it's not a once one um, solution for everybody, but it is a great place to start. And and you're so much more comfortable now. What was it like playing football with gout? Oh, so I, I actually got gout after I played football. So oh, I, was, I, okay. I, I, I was fine, and then I was. Um, very over, very overweight. So I went on puppies. I'm not puppies, but an Atkins diet. I did lose 30 pounds. I got stronger, and then I got the big, painful toe overnight, and that just did it for me. And that's from all the meat that you ate and the Atkins. Oh yeah, diet. yeah. Because um, so the studies have shown that um, uric acid levels come from um, meat protein and animal protein, but when you look at um, fresh um, plant based protein, it doesn't really raise up the uric acid that much. Very interesting. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. So tell us a little bit about what is the specialty of rheumatology? It's not just treating rheumatoid arthritis. It's treating mm -hmm. a vast amount of, and we're going to talk about all the different diseases as we go through the slides, but just give us a nice overview of what you do. So you are board certified in internal medicine. You spent three years in an internal medicine residency and mm -hmm. then went on and spent three years, I think, is it three years or two years in your fellowship? It's two years. Um, so some are two or three. So I did two years rheumatology fellowship. And you got certified in lifestyle, lifestyle board certified in lifestyle medicine mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. That's really great. All right, let's talk about uh, what, what does a rheumatologist see? What are the most common uh, rheumatic diseases that you see? Right, so uh, rheumatologists, rheumato the field of rheumatology, you know, is not very common. There's only about 200 graduates a year from the whole United States. So I'm not surprised if some of you out there have not even heard of this field of rheumatology. And the first thing you hear of when you think of rheumatology, you think of rheumatoid arthritis, and that's one of our bread and butter diseases that we do treat. So that's just one of them. We also treat lupus, we treat ankylosing spondylitis, vasculitis, and the field of rheumatology really is a focus on autoimmune diseases and arthritis of the connection tissue. So we go anywhere from the bone, the joints, and the tendons and ligaments as well. And our diseases are, are usually uh, include systemic inflammatory diseases. So our disease can affect any organ of the body from head to toe. So, so, um, so you really need to be versed in all the organ systems. So you are as an internal medicine doctor, and then it just sort of goes probably deeper into all of these interesting mm -hmm. um, inflammatory diseases. Okay, let's talk about this right here. This is like is is spondylo arthro uh, How do you say it? Spondylo arthropathies. Arthropathies. Okay, spondylo arthropathies. Okay, so you're looking. So this is showing me that ankylosing spondylitis connects mm -hmm. to all of these diseases. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah, so what ankylosing spondylitis is, is basically an autoimmune disease um, that can attack the tendons, um, and especially the lower back. Um, it's called a sacroiliac joint, which is part of your um, lower back that connects to the hip. Um, and spondyloarthropathies are a group of diseases um, that are connected in um, that they have commonalities in the way they attack the body and that sometimes they can attack the tendons and the joints and the pattern of the attack um, is related as well. So you have psoriatic arthritis on there. So you've probably heard of psoriasis. Psoriasis, you can get so arthritis as well. That's when you call it psoriatic arthritis. And that you can see um, pitting in the nails, you can see psoriasis, you can get attacks on the tendons, and you can also get attacks on the lower back area, which is similar to ankylosing spondylitis. Inflammatory bowel disease such as Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis can also be associated with arthritis, and that's part of a spondyl arthropathy um, connection as well. So you have this whole connection, and something called acute anterior uveitis, which is an autoimmune attack of the eyes, that can be connected with uh, spondyl arthropathies as well. So the, some of the treatments overlap in this um, spondyl arthropathy um, realm, so that's how they're all connected. Okay, so these are some um, symptoms. I, I I, I, some signs, but what I wanted to point point out is we've got a ticker tape going on the bottom so that people can follow you on social media. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep this running on the bottom. It's got your Facebook, your <clears throat> your Instagram. It's got the Institute of Plant Based Medicine Instagram, and it has your website. So all this information mm -hmm. will tell people how to follow how to follow you and how to contact you. So all right, so let's talk about the signs of ankylosing spondylitis. Mm -hmm. So yeah, ankylosing spondylitis. You know, it usually um, you get lower back pain or stiffness in the morning, more than 30 minutes. You can sometimes get something called emphysitis, which is a um, pain and inflammation at the site of the insertion of the tendon and ligament to the bone. And that can happen in elbows, the wrist, the Achilles tendon, the knees. Um, there's something called sacroiliitis, which is connection between um, the hip and the lower back area. It's the main the hip area, and you can see inflammation in that area. HLA-B27 positive is basically a genetic marker we look at for ankylosing spondylitis. We find that a lot of our patients are positive in that genetic marker, but you certainly don't need that in order to get diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis. Interesting. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's talk about the different types of arthritis. Let's talk, let's, let's have you talk about rheumatoid arthritis. And, and that this is near and dear to my heart because my mother had very serious rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. She had crippled hands on the right, but her left hand was fine because she had she wore a gold ring, so there was mm. thought that maybe the gold ring helped. But her right hand was uh, 
was definitely um, disfigured. Yeah, it's interesting you bring up the golden. Yeah. So, sorry. I just said, so let's talk about this. Oh yeah. So it's interesting you bring up the gold ring uh, because actually gold was a treatment for rheumatoid arthritis many, many years ago. Um, they gave gold, gold injections. Yeah, <laughs> um, <it's not. laughs> yeah so, um, so rheumatoid arthritis is basically autoimmune disease um, that attacks the joints, but it attacks multiple parts. Many organs attack the lungs, the eyes. You can get um, rheumatoid vasculitis, which is an autoimmune attack of the vessels. And you can see that on the um, skin sometimes as well, but mainly it attacks um, a certain area, so it attacks something called your MCPs, um, which are your first knuckles, and your PIPs, which are your middle knuckles. That's the classic areas they attack in the hands. And again, you can get morning stiffness more than 30 minutes. You get pain usually that's worse in the morning than at night. And your pain usually gets worse as you rest more, uh, and it gets better when you use them. But of course, not every patient will fit this textbook classic picture, um, but that's generally what we look for in uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And there's a couple of labs that we do look for. It's called um, rheumatoid factor. That's one of the labs we look for. And also we look for um, CCP antibodies, which are very specific for rheumatoid arthritis and patients that smoke out there there's a connection between smoking and rheumatoid arthritis so I do tell my patients you know you got to stop smoking there is a connection between rheumatoid arthritis and smoking and you can actually generate antibodies just from the smoking alone okay we have a question from Kim Delgado King she wants to know about how are pregnancies with rheumatoid arthritis mm -hmm. her mm -hmm. at, at age 14 Mm, so you can still get pregnant um, with rheumatoid arthritis. Of course, um, you do Oops. There's certain medications that have to be stopped to get pregnant. So if you decide medications, uh, when to stop them and when to start them again. And when you get pregnant and you have rheumatoid arthritis, sometimes the rheumatoid arthritis actually, actually gets better because when you're pregnant, it changes your immune system. So I would say, usually I tell my patients, a third of the patients will get better when they have, um, when they're pregnant and they have rheumatoid arthritis. A third will stay the same and a third will actually get worse. So it's really um, unknown how a patient will respond, but generally I would say the patients do get better. They do get better. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's really good to hear. That's really good to hear. And, and what are the treatments? Are they medication? Are they steroid based? Yeah. Um, do you put patients on a plant-based diet for that? How, how do you, uh, do they, are they on chronic? Now my mom was on, this was many years ago, but she was on chronic steroid therapy. She was on it for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so our treatments have come a long way um, for the, in the past 20 years. We have a new set of medications now called biologics that attack something called cytokine in the bodies. And cytokines are cell-to-cell -cell communication signals that can generate inflammation. And that's how everyone's body works. Mm -hmm. um, but in rheumatoid arthritis, the cytokines are uncontrolled. So our goal is to bring down those cytokines and bring down the inflammatory markers. So steroids, of course, are a mainstay of medication. But if we don't have to, we don't want to use steroids because there's so many complications and side effects of steroids. So we have something called biologics, something called disease modifying um, agents uh, called DMARTs. DMARTs are older agents. Um, they are usually oral medications and are uh, biologics are injection medications. So we have a lot of them out there. We probably have, I would say, over 10, 10 to 15 biologics now that we can use for rheumatoid arthritis. So when one medication doesn't work, we just cycle through the other medications. And how does plant-based nutrition play into this? Well, plant-based nutrition really gives an anti-inflammatory um, diet to the body and it can affect the gut microbiome because we, what's so important about this um, plant-based nutrition is that in a lot of autoimmune disease, there's um, your gut microbiome, there's something called gut dysbiosis and the gut is not out of balance. The bad bugs are overwhelming the good bugs. So how do we fix that? Well, one of the ways we can fix that is through fiber and phytonutrients. And that's what a plant-based nutrition can provide. So when I give this diet to my patient and say, just try this out, sometimes they can get better. I've seen some of them go to remission as well. But of course, everyone's physiology is different. But I would say uh, generally, it's uh, at least improves the patient when they go on a plant-based nutrition. And couple that with the medications, it's very, very powerful. So do you see a similar length of time after adopting a plant-based diet when 
patients get better? How long does it usually take? Is Does it depend on the type of rheumatic disease they have? Mm -hmm. Exactly. It depends on the type of rheumatic disease they have. It depends on genetics because we know half of autoimmune diseases are from um, genetics and the other half is from the environment. So environment includes diet, how you're raised, um, what's your environment like. So all these things play a role. Um, so the, the, how patients respond to it really depends on how long they've had the autoimmune disease, how many, are there any radiographic changes? Do we see um, holes in their bones? Do we see, it's, it's coming out erosions? Are there, are the bones being eaten away on the x-rays? Um, how their other lifestyle is, you know, um, time-based nutrition is just one aspect, but if they're smoking, if they're sleeping late, if they're really stressed, there's trauma, um, these things can fight against the plant-based nutrition. And whether or not they're actually taking their medication that uh, plays a role as well. So everyone's timeline is different, how everyone responds is different as well. Is your goal to get patients onto a plant-based diet? Do you see a better result if somebody goes all the way 100% or do you see benefits when someone just goes vegetarian, for example? Because Yeah, so, so the studies have shown, you know, omega-3 fatty acids are very beneficial. We can get omega-3 fatty acids from algae pills if you're vegan, fish if you're not vegan. Um, but, you know, chia seeds, flax seeds also have omega-3 fatty acids. So that's one thing I stress on a patient, you gotta get omega-3 fatty acids. But I always try to push them to be plant-based. Even if they're not plant-based, um, they sometimes do, do get better. Um, why is that? It's because, you know, Dairy is very can be um, you know an inflammatory um, um, gives inflammatory signals to the body. Um, we don't know why yet in rheumatology, but I've seen some of patients they just cut out dairy they get better. But also processed food is another big trigger. I would say out of everything, I would say you got to cut out processed food first. So describe um, what that is for people who aren't really sure what processed food is. Yeah, processed you food. You get in processed food as well. And you mm -hmm. see a difference between vegan processed food and and uh, non-vegan processed food? Yeah, I, so I was I, I lump all processed food together. I would say soda um, is, uh, refined sugar is a processed food. I would also categorize um, chips, um, they have a lot of refiners that fry them. That's processed food. Cereal you get at the store. That's also processed food. Um, also, um, the vegan meats, they're also processed. If you look at the ingredients, there's like so many ingredients on there um, that make it. It's very tasty. Um, it's probably better for the environment, but also it can be inflammatory for the body. So when, you, when I talk about plant-based nutrition, I'm talking about very natural foods. I'm talking about your fruits, your vegetables, your quinoa, your lentils, your beans, um, and many focusing on your fiber and your phytonutrients. Um, these are the things that um, make people live the longest. If you, um, you've probably talked about this on your show already, Lisa, the blue zones. Loma Melinda is one of the blue zones in the world. There's probably, it's, I think there's four or five other blue zones in the world. And the main state- there might, be, there might be six. We think there might be a six blue zone. Oh, Huntsville, oh, wow. Alabama, we're exploring that now. Oh, wow. That's I'm great. Looking at, I'm looking at doing a show with Dr. Milton Mills and people in Huntsville, Alabama, because they are a Seventh-day Adventist population who pretty much is vegetarian and vegan, and they live till over 100, so could be six. Oh, wow, yeah. I mean, you look at the people that live the longest in the world and just look at their diet, there's a reason why they're living longer um, than the rest of us. So, really, And what is that? The mainstay of that is plant-based nutrition. That's why I have to, I'm pushing my patients towards plant-based nutrition, because not only does um, rheumatic disease affect the joints, but it affect um, many part, many organs. So a lot of my patients, um, like rheumat rheumatic disease, um, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, they have an elevated risk for cardiac disease. Um, so you really got to push the plant-based nutrition to bring that down. To bring it down. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about, we talked about rheumatoid arthritis. What about this one? Sorry. We talked about a little bit about in the beginning of the show, psoriatic mm -hmm. arthritis and the signs so you can go through this and let's talk about this and how this is different from rheumatoid arthritis. And then of course, compare both of those to osteoarthritis. Yeah, yeah. So, so I love talking about this. I, some people find arthritis very boring. I find it very fascinating. So psoriatic arthritis um, is connected to psoriasis, but of course you don't have to have psoriasis to diagnose psoriatic arthritis, but it makes it harder. So the pattern, how is it different from rheumatoid arthritis? So rheumatoid arthritis usually attacks the first knuckles and the second knuckles, like I said. So rheumatoid arthritis usually attacks the middle knuckles and the last knuckles. Mm -hmm. And you can get something called 
dactylitis, also known as sausage finger. So you see the whole finger becoming enlarged. Uh, and that's because the soft tissue is also inflamed as well. You can see little pits in the nails. Um, and that can be from psoriatic arthritis because the tendons at the end of the fingers, they're inflamed and that can affect the nails. Also, um, it can attack um, the tendons in the elbows and the knees and the ankles, just like ankylosing spondylitis. And you can also see an ankylosing spondylitis pattern in that you can get lower back pain as well that can be affected. Um, and you can also get the, U the eye flares, the uveitis as well, just like the other spondyloarthropathies. So that's how it's different from rheumatoid arthritis and that's how it's similar to ankylosing spondylitis and the other spondyloarthropathies. Interesting. And and what's osteoarthritis? So osteoarthritis, um, so that is a wear and tear arthritis. That's not an autoimmune phenomenon. So usually I see it in my elderly population or patients that, you know, are in the military. There's a lot of trauma. Um, they jump out of um, helicopters, out of airplanes. Um, they do a lot of physical training. So there's a lot of wear and tear on the joints. And what we have been discovering is that there's an inflammatory component to osteoarthritis, mainly at the area of the joint. With the other rheumatic disease, we find systemic inflammation throughout the whole body. But in osteoarthritis, mainly at the joint, and the treatment is different. We don't give our biologics to these patients. It's mainly physical therapy, Tai Chi, acupuncture can sometimes help, um, NSAIDs, um, which are um, pain medicines such as ibuprofen, um, the proxim, meloxicam, these can help as well. And sometimes we give steroid injections at the area of the joint to make the inflammation there go away and patients do feel better. Okay. What do you think about the impact on the, on the gut microbiome when you use either um, ib, ib, you know, ibuprofen or, or, or naproxen, the, the various non-steroidal anti-inflammatory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it a balance for you? Yeah, so the um, the non steroidals, you know, they're just um, a blanket, really. They're they don't resolve the situation, and you know, it can be um, harmful to the gut microbiome. You know, um, the it can give you gastric ulcers as well. There's a lot of complicated gastric ulcers, kidney disease, and it's not really helpful to the gut. You know, the way to help the gut microbiome is really there's only a couple of solutions. Um, fiber and phytonutrients, those are the natural ways to help the gut microbiome. But other ways to help it, you know, studies have shown in rheumatology that our medications, when there's gut dysbiosis, when we give patients our medications, our biologics, sometimes it does resolve the gut dysbiosis, which is very surprising as well. Yeah, that's great. That's great. My mother had the dubious, um, uh, not honor, but it, it was horrible because she both had rheumatoid arthritis and ulcerative colitis. and. Oh entire life, my childhood, that's why I'm so passionate about what I do. Because for her entire life, she was first on Aristocort and then on prednisone. Mm. And then the doctor decided to take her off of prednisone suddenly. And she got so incredibly sick. But um, she, she struggled every day of her life. She couldn't keep weight on. She was in constant pain. Mm. And it was horrible. And everything she ate was chicken, sour cream and bananas. The bananas were good. She'd mm -hmm. have cottage cheese and she'd have things that didn't have fiber in them, white rice and you know a few vegetables, but she had to really watch the fiber. And of course they called it roughage. And I really didn't even know about beans or what legumes were until I left the house when I was, when I went to college, because we never had that in the house. Mm -hmm. So, it was, and now we know we want to feed patients with ulcerative colitis and rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely the opposite. So, I mean, I'm so, I'm, I'm really, I mean, so for the, for the audience that's watching, this is one of the reasons why I do this because I want to get the word out and bring interesting physicians in a variety of different specialties like this who are, who are conventionally trained board certified physicians, not, not, um, uh, people who are on the um, alternative outskirts. Now you're doing integrative medicine and alternative medicine, but you're doing it in conjunction mm -hmm. with traditional medicine. So you're seeing a big picture. Let's talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So right now I am getting um, taking courses in functional medicine and I'm also um, doing a second fellowship in integrative medicine out at the University of Arizona. So, you know, um, the reason why I'm doing functional medicine is because there's a lot of environmental toxins out there. And in rheumatology, we say that um, the environment does play a role and we know that certain things in the environment 
do affect our autoimmune diseases, such as silica, um, smoking, and other um, em environmental toxins out there, but we don't talk about it enough in rheumatology. We don't get educated in it. And you know, sometimes we wait till things are very definitive until we start talking about it and implementing it into our curriculum. So the reason why I'm doing functional medicine is because I want to know what the environmental toxins out there, they're the ones that usually are talking about this and I want to help my patients to see if there's any evidence of toxins affecting autoimmune disease and how it affects autoimmune disease at a basic science level. Also, I want to know if there's any connection between gluten and all the other possible myths out there that are affecting autoimmune diseases. And the reason why I'm doing integrated medicine is because I'm looking at different aspects of um, healthcare that people use um, to help their disease. A lot of my patients, they don't, they come in, they just don't use medicines, they use acupuncture, they use massage therapy, they use other modalities and integrative medicine really looks at nutrition. They look at possible Reiki has any evidence. They look at acupuncture and acupuncture is in our guidelines for osteoarthritis, um, it can possibly help. And we look at um, Ayurveda, I'm gonna be learning about Ayurveda and if there's any connection between that. And the mind-body medicine connection is so strong. We know that there's a gut and brain connection. Now we know there's a gut and joint connection. And there's also a lung and joint connection. And brain and joint connection is very strong as well. A lot of my patients have fibromyalgia. That's one of the things that we treat. and. It's so important for me not to only offer conventional medicine and plant-based nutrition because sometimes they don't really get better or they don't um, get go into remission. So what else can I offer my patients? That's why I'm going into the space. And I think I'm part of the only rheumatologist in the whole nation that's doing all of this. Um, and hopefully I can be a pioneer in this and bring answers to my patients with autoimmune diseases. Well, thank you for being so open-minded because really it, it you know pe people get pigeonholed into into their training and they they won't look beyond and i think the bottom line is evidence spaces it works repetitively it can be measured and tested and then you can you know do your studies mm -hmm. so simone reyes says what are your feelings about cbd for inflammation mm -hmm. so my patients um some of them do use cbd um, it's great for pain, um, but I don't know if there is any data on it bring, actually bringing down the inflammation itself. I, I see it as another bandage um, for pain, not really a way to bring down the inflammation. So, but, 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 but I think she's specifically interested in for inflammation. So pain caused by inflammation. Yeah, so I, I I sometimes see my patients, they do get better on the pain level, but the inflammation level, um, their inflammation markers are still high and they're still getting some morning stiffness. So I would say it doesn't really um, bring down the inflammation completely. I don't know the data um, behind, if there's any studies on it, bring down inflammation specifically, but I'll be looking into that. And if you follow me on my social media, I can get back to you. Perfect, absolutely. Well, we're gonna be connected forever. <laughs> <laughs> As we continue to go through this, um, you know, this 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 wonderful journey that we're all on trying mm -hmm. to bring forth you know, plant based nutrition and plant based medicine to the world. It's not just drugs, but it's not only and the message very is very strong. It's not just plant based medicine mm -hmm. it's in conjunction with other treatment modalities. Mm -hmm. so let's talk about lupus. Oh yeah, lupus. That's a lot of people's favorite um, disease because they hear it all the time on house. They saw it on house. They saw it, they see it on different TV shows. So lupus is an, another autoimmune disease that is the bread and butter of rheumatologists, and it's a systemic inflammatory disease that can affect multiple organs as well. Um, usually, patients present with um, the the butterfly rash, so the rash on the face. They're very sensitive to the sun. They get a rash and the redness in the sun within 10, 15 minutes. They get a lot of hair loss, joint pains, um, sometimes they get chest pain, and also they can get sores in the mouth and nose. Um, and one of the complications of this, um, the disease-threatening organs, is it can attack the heart, it can attack the kidneys. And some data has shown that patients with lupus has a 50 times higher risk than the general population of having cardiac disease. So that's very scary. Um, so it's a very, very, it can be a very scary disease for some people, but it can be very mild disease. And it really depends on genetics at the same time. And I've seen patients um, do better on plant-based nutrition with lupus as well. Mm -hmm. So you would recommend a fully plant-based diet? 
Oh yeah, for I I recommend that to all my patients. I I say if you can get there as vegan yeah. as plant based nutrition as possible, that's be great. If you can't, it's okay, but we're going to continue to work to that. Okay, so tell me about um, diversity. Is there diversity within these rheumatic diseases? Do you tend to see, so for example, in um, diabetes, so the African-American population tends to suffer worse from diabetes and they tend to have more heart disease and uh, they have more kidney, renal failure. So you mm -hmm. tend to see a disproportionate amount. Are there, can you make the same kinds of judgments for other nationalities and races when you're looking at rheumatic diseases? Who tends to get them? Yeah, certainly. So um, I would say all types of races get rheumatic diseases. There is diversity. Um, studies have shown that patients um, who are have lower um, education um, are at higher risk of getting these diseases. And why is that? Like I said earlier, half of it's genetics, the half of it is the environment. So so if you can probably make a connection, lower education, probably lower socioeconomics, and this leads to um, lower, so patients with lower education, they're probably not seeking information out on the internet. They're probably skipping their appointments possibly. I've seen these patients before. I see them in the clinic, they're flaring, but they don't want to come back or they just miss their appointments. So they're not on their medications. Um, they're eating more fast food. They don't, they have, um, they have lower accessibility to doctors sometimes and to fruits and vegetables, which are very important for antioxidants. And we do have studies in our patients sometimes, you know, in um, Hispanics and African-Americans, one medication works better for them, whereas Caucasians, another medication works better for them for the same disease. Mm -hmm. So there is diversity in rheumatic disease as well. Interesting. Interesting. What about Dr. Brooke Goldner and her, mm -hmm. uh, her, her, her lupus program? Yeah. Um, so, um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Dr. Brooke Goldner, I've never met her personally. I haven't never talked to her, but I do a little, know a little bit about her program. So she's a psychiatrist that um, had lupus. I believe she had um, lupus nephritis, which is uh, lupus of the kidneys. And she did um, a plant-based nutrition. I don't know what type. I think she wanted a raw diet. Um, and she claims that she uh, reversed her disease. And she also had antiphospholipid syndrome as well, mm -hmm. which is another autoimmune disease that rheumatologists treat that predispose patients to clots and miscarriages as well. And she claims that she was able to um, put her disease to remission and um, reverse this disease. I try not to use the term reverse too much. I do use remission more. Um, I think that's more appropriate. But she does use on her program, um, she does use a raw vegan diet. And she has been able to help um, patients with different autoimmune diseases, including rheumatic diseases through a raw vegan diet. Yeah, it's been it's very interesting. We have so much more to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how about this one, scleroderma? What are the signs? And let's talk about this particular uh, disease. Oh yeah, so scleroderma is another autoimmune disease that affects pretty much all the organs as well. But this disease has very um, pathognomonic or very um, specific signs that that say that this is scleroderma. So usually we see patients that have thickened skin, whether it's on the hands, the feet or the face or the body as well. So they're very, the skin is very tight. Um, they can something called interstitial lung disease that can pretty much affect a lot of rheumatic disease as well, but particularly scleroderma. So that is when your lungs get fibrosed. Um, you see a lot of changes in the lungs. I'm sure you've seen um, images of coronavirus affecting the lungs. That's what we see also in scleroderma as well. So patients have a hard time breathing and I've seen patients die from lung disease from this um, scleroderma. And also you can get joint pains, you get more um, particular ulcers on the fingers as well because your blood is having trouble getting to the fingers. So you get ulcerations. I've seen patients um, that in the hospital where I need to amputate fingers, um, I've seen a patient lose a whole hand because um, their fingers are being attacked either from clots or from scleroderma itself. And patients, sometimes they get bleeding from their stomach um, because it can dilate vessels in this disease as well. So this disease is, um, I feel very, very bad when I see patients with scleroderma because sometimes it can be very hard to treat. And um, it's also been connected to different environmental factors as well. Okay. All right. 
And then Pam Whistley says, can you read the screen here? Yeah, let's see here. Do you know anything about mesenteric paniculitis that is rare? I just got diagnosed with it. I have been vegan for seven years and abdominal surgery, which is a cause according to what I read. Unfortunately, I don't know much about mesenteric paniculitis. That's not something that I've treated in the past, and I don't know if that's something that rheumatologists actually treat. Um, if it is, it's probably treated at academic centers that specialize in this, and in conjunction probably with gastroenterologists as well. Okay, so would you would you say that she should be referred to a gastroenterologist? That I would. Say, I honestly don't know. It depends on what her manifestations are. Um, she should at least go to an uh, academic center um, because at universities they treat the rarest diseases and they're the most up to date on new diseases. Because in rheumatology, there are places where in Utah, like Cleveland Clinic which was one of the top places for rheumatology and they're diagnosing new diseases all the time because you know uh, autoimmune disease is very different than just say heart disease um, because heart disease we know what it is we see um, plaques there we attack it but for autoimmune disease there's um, all these different symptoms and they can attack different organs so new diagnoses are coming up okay all right let's talk about uh, if this is our last disease vasculitis yeah so it's, it's everywhere it affects yeah. all parts of the body yeah so vasculitis is uh, one of the more scarier diseases that are out there so vasculitis there's probably over 20 types of vasculitis out there this is this um um overarching word for different diseases so you and your body you have small vessels medium vessels and large vessels vasculitis can attack all types of vessels and I will just give you an example of a type of vasculitis. So we have something called um, granul granulomatosis with polyangitis, also known as GPA or Wegener's uh, before they changed their name. So that can attack the small vessel. So patients can have chronic sinus issues. They can get bleeding from the nose. They can cough up blood. They can get inflammation of their um, trachea. Um, they can get a hole. They actually, I've actually seen this. They can get a hole inside their nose. Mm. Um, they can get hearing issues, kidney issues, lung issues, um, with trouble breathing. So I've seen patients die on this several times already. Um, and depends on the manifestation of the disease. It determines the type of treatment. And, you know, the overarching theme of autoimmune disease and rheumatic disease itself is inflammation. We need to attack the inflammation. So what's surprising in that is that some of the vasculitis out there, um, the studies have shown that there's gut dysbiosis or an imbalance of the gut microbiome. And so what's surprising about this, the reason why it's surprising is that it doesn't, there's no gut symptoms, there's no GI symptoms, there's only inflammation of the vessels, but we already see a gut dysbiosis array. So what does that tell us? The gut is so important to all these autoimmune diseases. So if you can attack the gut and treat it properly with phytonutrients and fiber, then that should be the foundation to treatment so that you can at least be on your way to helping your medications treat yourself as well. So Dr. Angie Sadegi is one of my good friends and also the founder of the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine. And mm -hmm. I watch everything she does. I listen to everything she writes. I follow her on Instagram. Angie.Sadegi on, on, is her Instagram handle. And what I've learned from, from her is that our, there are more cells of microorganisms, which are not only bacteria, but viruses and other microorganisms that live in our gut mm -hmm. that actually comprise the entire human body. I mean, that's like, to me, trying to wrap my head around the speed of light. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, just, it's beyond my ability to comprehend how fast that is or how big. I mean, who am I? Am I Lisa or am I the, the cells and the DNA of all the organisms that live in my gut. It's really interesting. And I know that they, they need to be fed. And I think mm -hmm. that's what you're saying. So mm -hmm. if you starve them, they're not going to work for you. Would right. You know, exactly. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So, so, you know, the gut is comprised of trillions and trillions of uh, bacteria. And what's next to the gut? next to your gut lumen where all your food passes through is your immune system 60% of your immune system is right there 
And that Im your immune cells there, they just don't stay at the gut. When they're in communication with um, the gut there, they go through the blood vessels, the immune system, the immune cells, they travel throughout your whole body. So that's why it's so important to feed your gut. So you feed your immune system, you send anti-inflammatory signals to your immune cells there, and then the inflammatory signals will then go through your blood vessels and through the rest of your body. And again, I can't harp on this enough. What feeds the immune cells in a beneficial way? Fiber and phytonutrients, specifically fiber from natural foods, not your powder, um, but specifically from natural foods. So a whole food plant-based diet that's very colorful mm -hmm. should be the, way to, the easy way, the quick and dirty way to get there by default. Would you agree yeah. with that? Exactly. I completely agree with you, Lisa. And if, you're, if your plate is beige, you think you're in trouble? Yeah. So if, if your food is beige, everything is beige versus everything is brightly colorful. Mm -hmm. What would be the advantages and disadvantages of that? Yeah, so beige, depending on what kind of beige. So if it's with potatoes, that's a good beige. Yeah. If it's quinoa, that's a good beige. Brown rice is good for you as well. So you you want to include all the whole rainbow, every type of color you can right. get your hands on. The reason why is because there's something called phytonutrients in these different colors in your fruits and vegetables and your beans as well. And they each have a different function for the body. So beta carotene is in carrots and the orange color is very beneficial. Um, Turmeric um, has curcumin, it's orange in color as well. And grapes has something called resveratrol, which we, which gives wine the, benefic um, the benefits. And that has been proven to have anti-inflammatory properties. They already talked about this in the Journal of Nature Rheumatology as well. Um, so all these types of phytonutrients do play a role. You can't get enough of them. Um, and you know what? If you're not eating them, then you're leaving a huge, huge part of um, benefits to your body that you can really use. Now, they not only fight inflammation, but some of them have been shown to have um, cancer prevention. Um, some of them bring uh, help with your skin as well. So it's so important to just include everything. Just don't think about, oh, I got this, got to get this one color in today, only this color. Eat everything that you see at the grocery store. Make it colorful. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat beige food. I'm saying it shouldn't be only beige. Right. Exactly. Have a wide variety of colors because beige is definitely on the rainbow. But right. if, oh, if your plate is beige every day of the week, that would be a problem. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about switch for good. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm between now and the end of the year, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to help Dotsie Bausch, who is an Olympian. She won the silver medal in the 2012 Olympics. She was in cycling and she was almost 40 when she won that medal. And she was competing against women who were really young enough. They were 20 years younger than her. They were young enough to be her daughters. And she mm -hmm. scored that silver medal. So in the years since 2012, hasn't been that many, what, eight years? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, started an organization called Switch for Good. The four is the number four. And she is trying to get, along with a team of scientists, the United States Department of Agriculture's dietary guidelines come out every five years. And by the end of this year, those guidelines are going to come out. So she put together with a team of scientists this. Dairy does a body bad, a report on cow's milk health and athletic performance. Mm -hmm. So if you go to switchforgood.org, you can click on, it's on the upper right-hand corner. You can read this 48-page document. Dr. Yu, did you see this document? And what do you have to say about dairy and this document? And then I know you have to get to patients. Yeah, so I would say, first of all, it's so inspiring what Dotsie has been doing and Switch for Good has been doing for our community. It's so important. And I did take a look at this document. You know, um, dairy does affect different parts of the body in a very inflammatory way. On um, there, we've talked about, um, I think that someone talked about breast cancer in the report, bone health, which I'll talk about more since that's my field. Um, and the gut, it doesn't help with it in any beneficial way, really. So as far as um, bone health, um, dairy hasn't been proven to really help with osteoporosis. Studies have shown, there's some studies out there that some patients, um, some populations actually have had increased risk of um, osteoporosis. Some studies have shown that there's no benefits. I'm on the spectrum of 
that you don't need dairy to help with bone health. We don't know if it helps with bone health. There's certain calcium, there's vitamin D in it, but you can get calcium and vitamin D other ways as well without drinking dairy. And um, calcium and vitamin D, you can get it from your fruits and vegetables. You can get vitamin D from your sun as well. So there's many ways to help with bone health. And I see patients with osteoporosis all the time. And I tell them, you don't need your dairy. There's so many other ways to get your calcium and vitamin D to help with their osteoporosis. And it doesn't, certainly I have not seen it to help with um, autoimmune disease as well. Some patients, they do go on paleo diet to help with their autoimmune disease. And you know what? Paleo diet, they also cut out dairy as well. So this plant-based nutrition. So we have a common theme here. Dairy is not good for you. For autoimmune disease, it generates inflammation. So I've had a patient before that just cut out dairy by itself and she got better on dairy. She still had pain, but she got better. So that just tells you that dairy is, can be a trigger for patients. And why do you think they say, you know, dairy does a body good? This campaign is called Dairy Does a Body Bad. Can you talk about the campaign and who's behind? Do yeah. you think body good? Where yeah. You so, so I think we've all been fed since we were babies um, from the companies that dairy has been a body good in the commercials and everything. And that's something that we just live by. And, you know, all of us have grown watching TV. When, and that's every commercial there was. Milk does a body good. They're so great at marketing. And that has just been great at us. And even when we go to medical school and uh, even in uh, nutrition school, uh, that's like we don't say that dairy does a body bad because you don't get taught the ways that dairy does a body bad. So we just carry it into our medical system. So we don't fight it. We don't know about it. But I'm so glad that Switch for Good is bringing this out into light. And hopefully there will be some changes made. I think so. And and I just put the ticker on the bottom of the of the page and in the description on Facebook and in the description on uh, Jane Les Mitchell's Facebook page, on my Facebook page and on YouTube is a long description of about you. And at the very end of it, it has this link, which is hyperlinked. So what I'd like to ask everyone to do is to please uh, click on the link, download this report and get it into the hands of every plant-based clinician you know. That means dietitians, health coaches, nurse practitioners, and most of, mostly uh, most uh, your, your physicians. And just send it to your doctor and ask your doctor, doctor, can you please, you know, I've been a patient for X number of time, could you please read this document and give me your feedback? Mm -hmm. That's really what we want to do, because I think when people see it, they'll, 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 it's a call to action. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Micah, you, this has been a great time. It's, we, we, we I, I need to let you get back to your patients, but thank you so much for being here. And um, I hope I get to have you back again and we can talk about in detail, maybe find some other things, some new things to talk about. Of so, course. Th for, thank you so much, Lisa, for your show. Many opportunities to talk. So thank you so much. I'm Lisa Carlin, uh, your host of Hey Doc, What's New in Plant-Based Medicine. Please share the feed and comment. And uh, Dr. Yu, if you wouldn't mind going on to uh, Jane's Facebook page and mm -hmm. answering the comments, that would be fabulous for the next couple of days. Now, Dr. Yu can't ask give specific medical advice, but he can speak in generalities and maybe point you in the right direction. So thank you very much. I'm going to sign off. Thank you, Lisa. It's been a pleasure. Okay. Bye. Bye.